chapter 21, Poisoning and Overdose Emergencies. So this chapter is going to give you just a very, very uh, broad overview of some of the many risks or hazards that exist in the form of poisons. And thinking about poisons, let's, let's think from an abstract point of view for a second. What exactly is a poison? You know, the, the book here defines a poison as any substance that can harm the body. But in reality, you know, that, that's a very bold statement because anything can potentially harm the body if it's out of whack. If we have too much oxygen, that could be a harmful poison to the body. If we have too much water, water can harm the body. So really, in, in a general sense, looking at the, the pure definition there, too much of anything can be a bad thing. And that includes anything from illicit drugs all the way up to simple uh, oxygen toxicity and everything else in between. There's lots of different things that people commonly overdose on. Uh, obviously, oxygen would not be an example of a common overdose, uh, but things like medications, uh, cosmetics, pesticides can be incidental, um, and then plants and, and food especially can pose a lot of risk to humans. There's varying effects of a poison on the body. Um, a lot of the factors that impact how the poison affects the body include the patient's weight, um, their general, uh, well, gender could play into it, their age, uh, generally how their body tends to respond to things. I mean, I'm sure we all know people who have uh, super sensitive uh, digestive systems that if they eat anything that's just slightly spicy or, or anything else, it causes a lot of GI problems. And then there's people who can eat spicy all day long and they've got you know rock solid stomachs. And at the end of the day, it just goes to show everybody's a little bit different. So what that means is that as we assess our patients, especially patients who have ingested some type of poison, uh, we need to treat them all independently. We can't look at something and say, oh, well, this shouldn't cause a problem. You know, it's, it's just a little bit or it's not a big deal. Uh, in fact, depending on the patient and their body type and size, uh, it could, could be a pretty significant event. There are several different routes by which a poisoning uh, can occur. You can ingest poisons. They can be inhaled. They can be absorbed through the skin. Or they could even be injected. And the key word for the absorption here is unbroken skin. Um, you know, typically we think of breaks in the skin, scabs, cuts, that type of stuff, or even psoriasis or eczema as being a source for something to enter through the skin. But in fact, with a lot of poisons, uh, they can go through unbroken skin just as easily. So we want to really keep an eye on that and not, uh, not make any assumptions that the skin is going to be an overall protective measure. A uh, pediatric note here just reminds us that we should be childproofing our own homes. I know that almost seems kind of uh, condescending to, to put that in here and say, oh, don't forget EMTs, you need to do it too. Uh, but the truth is, you know, we're probably some of the worst culprits when it comes to complacency around the home and not doing the things that we preach. So keep that in mind. You know, Our own children are just as much at risk of, of uh, poisonings and exposures as anybody else's. So let's look at... Uh, a couple different considerations when it comes to poisons. A child, you know, children typically are curious. They want to taste something. They want to explore something. And we know that especially young children, they explore with their hands and they explore with their mouth. So a lot of times we'll get poisons uh, that are introduced into the body through the, uh, the digestive system. And that's primarily based out of curiosity. Um, at the same time, though, if an adult ingests some amount of poison, uh, we assume that they should probably know better. And it would be difficult to, to argue that the ingestion was simply accidental. So in those circumstance, circumstances, we have to consider, is this possibly an intentional overdose? Is this a suicide attempt? You know, what was the patient thinking when they did that? And beyond simply treating the poisoning, there may be a behavioral or a psycho, uh, psychological um, treatment that's also required there. When it comes down to patient assessment, for the most part, this is common sense. Obviously, we want to know what it is that was ingested uh, or what the exposure was. It doesn't have to be ingestion. That's just one of the more common routes of a poisoning. We can take a look at the container uh, from which the poisoning came from, or maybe it was a baggie, maybe it was a, a pill bottle. You know, whatever the case is, let's take a look. Let's see how much is supposed to be in there, and let's see how much is gone. And from there, we can try to get an idea of not only what was ingested, but also how much was ingested. Beyond that, we also want to know when did the exposure occur and over what period of time did the exposure occur. And 
considering alcohol, right? Alcohol can be a poisoning, as we know, as a matter of fact, that it is a poison. And if we ingest too much of it, it can have uh, lethal effects on the body. However, if I were to tell you that I just drank 24 beers, you'd probably be relatively concerned saying, hey, you know, that's, that's an excessive amount and there's a chance that we could have a, a true medical emergency here. But if I told you that I drank those 24 beers over 24 days, not a big deal. That's a beer a day, right? Um, even if I said I drank 24 beers over three days, it's probably not the end of the world. It's not the same as if I were to drink 24 beers over six hours. So the time in which that exposure occurred, along with the quantity, and, you know, those are big considerations that determine just how bad off our patient may be. Uh, what interventions have been taken? And a lot of times we'll find that, especially with children, um, you know, parents will jump on Google. They will Google the home remedy for something and they'll try to care for it themselves. When in fact, we know that a lot of times patients need that medical attention, that, that complete evaluation at the hospital. Uh, we do also have access to poison control, and that's not just for EMS professionals, but that's for anybody, including the, the lay person. So if mom or dad or the babysitter contacted poison control and introduced remedies based on their instructions, that's perfectly acceptable. We want to get an idea of what that was so that we can document it and pass it along to the hospital. What effects has the patient experienced? You know, Are they experiencing any effects at all? Is this something where we're expecting them to experience effects down the road? You know, we have patients all the time that uh, overdose on something like, let's say, aspirin. Well, the effects of the overdose on aspirin in the first 10 to 20 minutes is not a big deal. Over the next couple hours, though, that's going to be pretty catastrophic. So uh, simply identifying what it, what it is that they took, when they took it, how much they took, um, and whether or not they're starting to feel anything, those are some basic patient assessment uh, questions that we should be identifying. Food poisoning. I think we've all probably experienced food poisoning at one time or another. Uh, you know, something that's of interest is that food poisoning can occur within hours or a day or two later. So a lot of times we associate food poisoning with something that we just recently ate, when in fact it could have been two or three meals prior that we had the exposure to the bacteria that causes food poisoning. And food poisoning is typically what we would uh, associate with simple symptoms like the stomach bug. Uh, nausea, vomiting, uh, diarrhea, that type of stuff. However, while food poisoning is, is rarely going to be life-threatening, um, although it can be, it rarely is, the symptoms that present as a result of it can be quite an issue. If somebody's got really bad food poisoning, they haven't been able to eat or drink anything in a day or two. Uh, they haven't been able to uh, keep anything down. They're vomiting, diarrhea, everything else. Their body's going to be relatively dehydrated. And especially with some of our at-risk populations, like elderly or children, um, that level of dehydration is not tolerated well at all. So these could be some pretty significant uh, issues that these patients are dealing with, requiring urgent medical care. Activated charcoal is not something that is used in our system. I don't believe activated charcoal is used very much at all anymore. Um, but in the event that you run across it, just a basic familiarity. Activated charcoal is something that uh, it, it's... If you think about a fish tank, your coffee maker, um, a fountain, all of those things have charcoal filters built into them. So activated charcoal is the exact same thing. Uh, we actually introduce charcoal into the, the digestive system. That charcoal allows the, the poison or the elements to bind to it. And then through that binding process, it's able to be passed out the backside of the body and uh, it prevents any of the absorption of those chemicals. So it doesn't always work, it's not always effective, it's not always appropriate, and again it's not used in our system, but something to just be generally uh, aware of. And uh, syrup of Ipecac is something that used to be used uh, in the past and that actually induces vomiting. So the thought process was if somebody ingests some poison or uh, a toxin that we should cause them to vomit and then get that out. And while there's some validity to that, and even the hospital may pump the patient's stomach to get the contents out, um, they were also finding that it was doing some damage to the airway, the risk for aspiration was there, and it just generally wasn't as productive as what they hoped. It, from time to time, you may be instructed to have the patient dilute something. Now, rarely will we actually provide any kind of uh, uh, liquid to drink in the field. 
but if we are dealing with a poisoning uh, emergency, we can contact poison, poison control. We can also contact uh, medical control. And if we're directed by either one of them to administer juice, administer milk, water, etc., to dilute some of the effects, then we will certainly do so. Those aren't things that we carry on our ambulance, though, so hopefully they would have those at their home. From time to time, we do have antidotes available to some type of poisoning. The example listed here is Narcan. So Narcan is, is truly an antidote to the heroin or the narcotic overdose. However, we have to keep in mind that even antidotes wear off over time. So depending on the quantity of the drug that was taken and over the time in which it was consumed, uh, we have to be concerned that the antidote may wear off prior to the drug itself. So in this situation here, it just takes you through kind of a, uh, a picture editorial of how this may play out. You know, you have this elderly woman here. Maybe she has dementia. Um, she's not tracking her meds appropriately. She accidentally took too many of a medication. So in this case, it shows calling medical direction or poison control. Either one would be appropriate. And then you give her the activated charcoal. And I put that little comment on there because really it does look like asphalt being drawn up through that, that straw. Again, not something used in our system, but just have a general familiarity with it, okay? Uh, we also have lots of uh, inhaled poisons that we can be exposed to. We've talked about carbon monoxide quite a bit in class. Um, things like ammonia, chlorine gas, other types of uh, hazardous materials may be available out there. Uh, you guys may remember in class we talked about the carbon dioxide poisoning at the McDonald's in Phoenix. Um, and that wasn't necessarily a, a poison that was just simply displacing oxygen in the environment. And the oxygen deficiency is what caused the issues there. Uh, probably the biggest hazards with these inhaled poisons is the fact that they're airborne. And that means that we're just as likely to be exposed to them as our patient was. So we really need to have that heightened index of suspicion, identify the likelihood of a possible inhaled issue or a, an airborne issue there, and take appropriate steps to protect ourselves. And usually that's going to be done with respiratory protection. It could be something as simple as an N95 mask or something as elaborate as an SCBA. With true... Uh, true hazardous material incidents, then we're going to actually bring in the hazmat techs and they have specialized suits that prevent that uh, those gases from entering in and getting toward the body or the respiratory tract. I don't put a whole lot of stock in the signs and symptoms of all these poisonings because it all varies. It depends on, on what it is that the patient is exposed to and the quantity. So um, anytime a patient presents atypical you know whether or not they, they present something abnormal whatsoever we should be trying to figure out why it is that they're presenting that way you know could they have been exposed to something and go from there but other than that you know these signs and symptoms are just very broad and can be related to many different things the assessment process for inhaled poisons is no different than ingested or injected poisons um, we want to know how much when it occurred um, you know, are they exposed or experiencing any effects? The same question, same assessment. In the event that we do have an inhaled uh, poison, uh, high flow oxygen is most likely going to be appropriate, trying to, to offset some of that. But we also have to keep in mind that the patient may have experienced airway burns or uh, whether it be from heat or chemical emergencies there. So if that's the case, they may have a difficult time uptaking that, that uh, oxygen. Our best thing is going to be rapid transport. Carbon monoxide, colorless, odorless, tasteless, so that, that kind of makes it an issue, right? There's, it's going to be very difficult to identify. Most EMS agencies actually have carbon monoxide monitors attached to their first end bag. So as we walk in the house with our bags, the monitor is always on, it's ready to go, and if it starts to alarm, that'll clue us into things. Um, carbon monoxide is really a big deal because any, any type of appliance, any source of gas in the house, uh, if it stops working appropriately, can produce that carbon monoxide. So in most homes that, that run off a of natural gas, that includes the gas dryer, it includes uh, the stove or the range, it includes the water heater, the furnace, and other appliances as well. So there's lots of uh, different sources there. We have to be very careful. Carbon monoxide binds to the hemoglobin on the red blood cells, and it displaces the oxygen. So it, it causes the patient to become uh, extremely ischemic and hypoxic. Although with the SpO2 monitor, keep in mind that if we put that on our patient, it would probably read 98, 99, 100 percent. 
because all it's reading is the saturation of the hemoglobin. It's not reading how much oxygen is there. Under normal circumstances, we assume that it's oxygen that saturates the hemoglobin, but in the instance of a carbon monoxide emergency, that wouldn't be the case. So we've talked a little bit about the CO monitors there and their benefit. Uh, treatment for a patient with carbon monoxide poisoning, obviously getting them out of the environment is priority number one. Administering high flow oxygen is priority number two. Transport is priority number three. And from time to time, your protocols may instruct you to transport or have them flown to a hospital with a hyperbaric chamber. And that hyperbaric chamber allows them to take them down to pressure and it pushes the carbon monoxide out of the tissues there and allows for, uh, allows for it to be excreted. Smoke inhalation, beyond the potential burn issues that exist with that, we know that smoke is very toxic. You know, firefighters are coming down with cancers at alarming rates these days because everything in our home is made out of a petroleum-based product. And look around you right now, whether you're in your car, sitting at home, or at school, it doesn't matter. Everything around you is petroleum-based. All of the wood furnishings, it's probably some type of press board that includes a bunch of glue. It's probably got a plastic laminate over the top of it. Very little furniture is actually true wood anymore. So all of these things uh, create a lot of hazards for us. Carbon monoxide is one of the big pri uh, byproducts that exists in smoke, but additionally to that is cyanide. And cyanide is something that we started to learn a lot more about probably about two decades ago. And what we started to understand is that while CO is immediately available file, uh, following a fire, and we can take our CO monitors in to, to make sure that it's cleared out before we take our masks off, um, cyanide was also in existence, and we weren't monitoring for that. And that cyanide stayed around for a lot longer than the CO did. And what happened is the cyanide was getting into the, the bodies of these firefighters that were doing overhaul after a fire, and it was killing them a day, maybe two days later. With carbon monoxide, we start to see the effects almost immediately, especially in high concentrations. But with cyanide, it's a delayed response. And it would be a matter of you know a guy or a girl going home that, that following day after shift, and then they would have some some lethal event occur mid-afternoon the following day. So um, keep an eye on, on these types of things. If you're working as a firefighter and you're in an environment following the fire, make sure that you've got respiratory protection and that you're monitoring for all types of gases. Signs and symptoms of smoke inhalation is exactly what you would expect. They're going to have brown or blackened boogers. Uh, they're going to be coughing up soot potentially. Uh, they could be very hoarse because of any burns to the, the vocal cords or the airway surrounding the vocal cords. Uh, swelling would be a primary issue that we have to worry about. These patients are especially difficult because if that smoke was superheated, if it was hot and it caused airway burns, as a BLS provider, you don't have any definitive resources to establish that airway. So the only thing you can do there is request ALS or uh, rapid transport. The sooner we get the patient to a hospital, the better because as that tissue begins to swell, it will entirely occlude the airway and there's absolutely nothing we can do about it pre-hospital. Detergent suicides was a thing uh, years back. I haven't heard much about these for quite some time, but what it was is people would get into a confined space, typically their vehicle. They would mix a couple different chemicals together and as those chemicals became mixed, it would off-gas this noxious, uh, noxious chemical or these noxious fumes and it ultimately end up killing them. So it was a, a quick, painless way to commit suicide. The hazards especially existed though for the EMS providers or the first responders because people would arrive on scene and the first thing you do is you break out the window to open the, the door and try to help this patient. Well, not knowing what was inside, you know, the first cop on scene breaks out a window and all of a sudden they're overcome by these fumes. And there was a, a few cases throughout the world uh, first responders being killed because of the exposures to this stuff. Um, so then after it got some publicity, people were nice and they started putting signs on the inside of their vehicle, you know, essentially saying that, hey, this is a hazmat situation, stay clear. It still allowed them to, to commit suicide, but it didn't cause any harm to the first responders when they showed up. All right, absorbed poisons, lots of different types of absorbed poisons. Uh, think about poison ivy. Right, coming in contact with that, um, the poison itself comes in contact with the skin, and that's absorbed through the skin, and that's what causes the rash and the pain.
so nothing that we're going to do different with the absorbed poisons as far as the assessment goes. We may want to consider brushing it off if it's a dry powder. Uh, some things we want to irrigate with water, but we need to identify what it is first. Some things will react poorly with water, uh, and it, it's not appropriate to use that. The other thing we have to think about, too, is the runoff. So if I have, a let's say, a, a dry powder burn on my chest, and I'm instructed, or my the EMS provider is instructed to irrigate that to rinse it off, well, once it becomes wet, where is it going to run? You know, is it going to run down? You know, toward the lower uh, lower torso, is it going to run down to the legs? Is it going to cause burns in other parts of the body? So we really need to be careful. And more times than not, what we're going to do again is brush that powder off and then uh, irrigate afterward. Lots of different types of injected poisons, anywhere from, you know, the venom of a snake or a bee, all the way to illicit drugs, you know, that are injected, such as heroin and, and stuff like that. Um, it's a very, very wide or broad range of things. Again, our assessment is going to be the same. Uh, our treatment is going to be to treat the underlying, uh, underlying signs or symptoms. Alcohol and substance abuse. This is a, a, diff a difficult one for me. Uh, I'm very fortunate in the fact that I never had any uh, alcohol abuse in my family, whether it be immediate or, or distant family members. So I was never really exposed to this all that much. Uh, prior to getting on the job. Obviously, you know, we've all had uh, our fair share of, of alcohol, but truly being exposed to alcohol abuse was, was not something that I, I had ever uh, done. So when we started dealing with these patients, these alcoholics that were overdosing on alcohol, right, they're getting hammered on a regular basis, uh, I got really frustrated. You know, to me, it seemed like, hey, this is something stupid. You're wasting our time. You know, you, you call 911, you've, you've urinated, you've uh, defecated yourself, you're, you know, being combative, you're being a jerk to us. You know, this is ridiculous. And I, I really developed a, um, a dislike for those patients. And to be honest, it, it affected the level or the quality of my patient care. And it wasn't until I'd been on the job for a couple years and I started to learn more. And really, it wasn't until I started teaching and having to research this stuff a little bit that I realized that alcohol abuse, although it was a choice to start drinking, once that dependency uh, existed, uh, it's not necessarily just a simple choice to stop. Alcohol abuse is a disease. And no different than, you know, I, if I'm not going to be mad at a cancer patient for having cancer, uh, if I'm not going to be mad at, uh, you know, any other patient that has this, this disease, I shouldn't be mad at my alcoholics either. Because, again, once that dependency occurs, it's really difficult to kick that habit. And, uh, and I shouldn't even say habit because it's not necessarily habit. Once that disease occurs, it's very difficult to eradicate that disease. So I have to develop some uh, additional understanding and some compassion for these patients. It's really, really something that is beyond their control in many circumstances. So at the end of the day, alcohol is a drug, though. Um, and it most certainly can be addictive. And different people with different personalities and other dependencies um, may get addicted a lot quicker than others. Um, others may be able to, to kick the habit or the dependency pretty easily. But um, just understand that alcohol is a poison. Uh, it is a drug. And it can also be a disease. So signs and symptoms of alcohol abuse. Pretty simple, right? Uh, any observations of intoxication. And with that, we all present a little bit differently. We've seen people respond differently. Um, you know, some people get angry when they're drunk. Some people get happy when they're drunk. Uh, some people fall asleep when they're drunk. Some people uh, tolerate a lot of alcohol. Some people tolerate very little alcohol. You know, are they uh, slurring their speech? Are they stable on their feet? Um, you know, what are all the typical signs and symptoms of that intoxication? One thing that we have to be careful with, though, staying objective, especially with our reporting, is we have to be careful not to simply state that the patient was intoxicated. Um, if the patient admits to drinking a lot of alcohol and we know for a fact that they're, they're definitely intoxicated, that's fine. But generally speaking, you know, somebody who appears intoxicated, um, unless we know for sure what their blood alcohol content is, we can't say that definitively. So we should document it objectively by stating, you know, patient admitted to alcohol use, patient was unstable on their feet, patient presented with uh, slurred speech, 
you know, those specific or objective findings that uh, allow us to imply that they were drunk, but without actually coming out and saying it. Uh, we know that as, especially as the, uh, the amount of alcohol consumed increases, blurred vision, double vision, confusion, um, you know, altered mental status, all of these things tend to uh, begin to present themselves. And while you may think that being drunk is a problem, not being drunk can be an even bigger problem. Alcoholics who go through the withdrawal process, their bodies rely on that alcohol. They need that alcohol. That dependency exists. And when all of a sudden that alcohol is deprived of their body, it's a violent, violent withdrawal process. And it can include hallucinations. It can, they can become combative, um, nausea, vomiting, uh, abdominal pain, all sorts of stuff that can come as a result, uh, including you know even things like seizures. So when they're going through these withdrawals, um, they're not going to be pleasant to work with under any circumstance. But our job is to be compassionate and especially to respect the fact that what they're going through is really tough. And whether or not we, we agree with what happened, whether or not we think that this was a, a social issue um, rather than a medical issue, it doesn't really make a difference. Our job is to provide the same level of care for these patients as we would for anybody else. All right. So assessing alcoholic patients, no different than any other patient. So just ask them, uh, and don't be afraid to come out and ask, you know, have you been drinking today? And if so, how much? And what have you been drinking? Right? It's simply stating, you know, oh, I had three beers. That doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, what type of beer? Some beer is 3% alcohol content. Some beer is 12% alcohol content. So we need to figure that out. If these patients, whether intoxicated or going through withdrawals, do begin to vomit, we want to be extra careful to take care of that airway, prevent any risk of aspiration. That may require us to put them in the recovery position um, and uh, or sit them up if they are still awake and talking. Beyond that, we should monitor their vital signs and, and treat them as we would any other patient. Uh, if any signs or symptoms present, any shortness of breath or anything like that, we would treat them appropriately. Substance abuse is, is grouped in now with the alcohol, so uh, although we'll talk about a few different types of drugs, um, the overall assessment process, um, the risk for, for withdrawals, and the treatment are all the exact same. So with substance abuse, we have uppers. Uppers are stimulants, things that really kind of get us amped up. Uh, cocaine, amphetamines, those are two primary examples. And in those situations, we would expect to see things like tachycardia. Uh, they may be sweating all signs of increased metabolic rates because that's essentially what it does. Downers on the other hand, uh, downers are depressants. We would see that with something that really slows the system down. Alcohol is an example of that. You'll also see up here different barbiturates, uh, roofies, uh, or also known as the date rape drug. Those things are all examples of depressants. And what happens is it slows the whole system down. The pupils become sluggish, the body in general slows itself down, uh, pulse and respiration slow down, and with that we typically see a drop in blood pressure as well. With narcotics then, so narcotics we, we talk about, fent or I'm sorry, we talk about heroin quite often. Um, understand that up until the 1950s, heroin was a prescription drug that you would have gotten from your doctor and filled by a local pharmacy. And it wasn't until heroin became, uh, until they understood the the extremely high um, addiction rates of heroin that they decided to make it illegal. But yeah, as recently as 70 years ago, that was a prescription drug. So we still have lots of narcotics similar to heroin. We have fentanyl, we have morphine, um, we have codeine, you know, all of these things that, that are still within the same classification of narcotic painkillers. So when we talk about narcotic pain or narcotic overdoses or even opiate overdoses, we're not just simply talking about some druggie that made poor social decisions in life. We're talking about the 45-year-old male who got into a car accident, uh, has chronic back pain, got addicted to drugs, doctor stopped filling those drugs, so now he's going to illicit street use to try to, to meet those pain demands. Um, you know, we see this with elderly patients where they they have a, a long-standing addiction to pain medication because of a chronic condition. Uh, so these are not just the junkies that we find sitting behind a dumpster in a back alley. These are regular, ordinary people that haven't necessarily made any poor decisions in life. They've just been 
you know, they've been exposed to some unfortunate circumstances. So that means we have to maintain that, that raised or that heightened index of suspicion. If anybody presents with the signs and symptoms of a narcotic over overdose, we should consider that that may actually be the case. Don't rule it out based on socioeconomic class or any other factors. Signs and symptoms of the narcotic overdose is the big things, respiratory depression and pinpoint pupils. If you notice those two things, that's probably what you've got. And any time that a patient is unconscious or not responding appropriately, uh, appropriately to me, the first thing I do is I look at their pupils. Very, very first thing. And if their pupils are constricted bilaterally, I'm going to look at their overall respiratory effort. And if it's uh, depressed, I'm going to say, hey, this is probably going to be some type of narcotic overdose. Uh, and if that's the case, we can administer the Narcan right away. Something to keep in mind, though, in the treatment of these patients is even though Narcan is the appropriate drug for a narcotic overdose, we still need to treat the respiratory components as well. So while we are prepping the Narcan, we should also be prepping the oxygen and getting them on oxygen. Keep in mind that our dosing for Narcan is a lot lower than it is in the general public. Um, we're going to administer 0 0.4 milligrams per, per dose. We have the ability to repeat that, but that's going to be our dosing. Um, the general police or general public, they administer two milligrams right off the bat. So they administer five times the dose that we do. And the reason that we're administering little bits at a time is because we understand the risk to the withdrawal by quickly taking away the patient's high that can actually cause quite a few issues for them. In addition to that, when they wake up all together and we've taken their high away, they aren't usually very appreciative. You know, never have I heard, oh, hey, thanks for saving my life. I'm such an idiot. Um, it's typically, you know, you took my high away, that cost me 15 bucks, what are you doing? Leave me alone. They end up wanting to, to refuse care, refuse transport, and sign off. And unfortunately, at that point, they're alert and oriented times four, and they are sure able to sign off if they so choose. We also have hallucinogens, uh, LSD, PCP, we, we see uh, mushrooms from time to time. So those hallucinogens tend to cause those visual hallucinations that, uh, um, cause the patient to, to really have some distress, right? You know, they, they see things that don't exist. Um, they become very paranoid. Uh, they can become scared, and as a result, they become combative and irrational. Dilated pupils, rapid pulse, and flush face are things that we may see with those. But even, you know, by simply observing those things, we're not going to come to the conclusion that they're on some type of hallucinogen. We're going to need some type of background, background information or history to, to better understand that risk. Volatile chemicals, those are things like uh, huffing, you know, paint cans, that type of stuff. Uh, I don't understand why anybody does this whatsoever. All this does is kill brain cells. That's it. You get a, a short temporary high, it kills a whole lot of brain cells, and then you're done. You got to do it again. Uh, so these patients typically will present dazed, um, just kind of a, a few bricks short of a full load, if you will. Um, you might start to see a lot of swelling around the tissues uh, of the airway structures or the nose. You know, just sig signifying that there's uh, chemical damage being done to those tissues. Um, but beyond that, they can present in any way, shape, or form. These patients a lot of times are in denial. They don't want to admit to what they've done, um, especially because a lot of times they're kids. They don't want mom and dad to find out. Uh, we're going to treat the appropriate signs and symptoms and prepare them for transport. And that really wraps it up. Um, again, a broad chapter, broad overview. Poisonings, overdoses, a lot of stuff exists out there. Be sure to always be aware of your surroundings. Identify the potential for hazardous material exposures. Um, understand and be more compassionate for our uh, patients with addictions to alcohol. And uh, generally just always, always, always be aware of what could possibly be uh, affecting your patient. That's it. Have a great day. We'll see you in class.